Oh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, Congress punts on infrastructure again, score a touchdown with the National Infrastructure Bank. Uh, tonight, uh, we will be talking about um, the National Infrastructure Bank, the real National Infrastructure Bank, not all these fake ones that continue to be tossed around in, <clears throat> in Congress as, as uh, they have these discussions. Uh, this is the only one that's a real bank and that's something that uh, we need to keep in mind as we're going. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. My name is Bob Lynn, and I'm a retired union organizer with the Plumbers and Pipefitters uh, in Toledo, Ohio. And I have been working with the coalition in, in several capacities uh, for several years now. And I'm uh, right now the labor liaison uh, for the coalition. Um, <clears throat> Tonight, we will have a number of speakers to be able to talk about um, what is going on as far as our, our uh, proposed legislation. Um, let's see. Uh, so we need to be able to, we need to be able to make things happen uh, as best as we can uh, to be able to <clears throat> bring uh, this opportunity of this National Infrastructure Bank to reality. Uh, if you have never joined us before, uh, the simple thing on this bank is that it's been done four times before. It was done by Alexander Hamilton and George Washington uh, when they started the country. It was uh, done by John Quincy Adams, uh, Abraham Lincoln. And the last time it was actually done in this country was uh, with Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, <clears throat> when he had the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. So uh, this is not a unthought of idea. This is an idea that uh, really has uh, been well thought out. And it's something that I believe that uh, we have forgotten in our history. And it's something that we need to bring to the forefront. And hopefully after you're on this phone call and you get an opportunity to hear what's going on, if you haven't been involved, uh, you will jump in and, and help us to be able to make some things really happen. So with that being said, we're going to move on. We, get, we have a number of speakers and I don't want to belabor the point. Uh, we're going to start off with Alfeca Mutardi. And Alfeca is uh, the chief economist for the coalition. So Alfeca, uh, carry on. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to pull up my slides uh, because we had a last minute change on uh, the presentation that I need to make. I want to talk to you today about two things. Normally, I talk to you about how the bank works. Uh, and uh, our, you know, our costing and our infrastructure um, costing uh, estimates. But um, you, 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 if you haven't, if you're new to the coalition, maybe you can go to the uh, to the web page and uh, there's some videos there on how this bank works. Uh, but since our our theme this time is uh, the Congress punts again, and we would like to uh, uh, in, enact a in national infrastructure bank that will really do the job, uh, I wanted to do two things today. I wanted to tell you about uh, the latest developments on trying to finance infrastructure through the budget. And then I would like to tell you uh, a little bit about uh, proposals in Congress for infrastructure bank proposals uh, to top up this spending, and then how they differ from our uh, bill, HR 3339, uh, which will do the job and bring us a home run for infrastructure in our country. So uh, to start out with, this is a slide on developments of uh, funding, financing, or trying to finance infrastructure through the budget. Some of you may uh, have been following the news and knew that uh, President uh, Biden, when he first uh, introduced all of his packages, had an American jobs plan for infrastructure and then an American families plan, and then he still needs to uh, come up with a budget for the next fiscal year. Uh, but the um, American jobs plan has been sort of supplemented or replaced now by this Senate bipartisan plan, uh, which has uh, enough uh, Republican uh, co-sponsors on the plan to see, to see if they can get it uh, passed through a 60% uh, vote, uh, 60 vote margin in the Senate. Uh, this bill, uh, it calls for, it's a, it's a plan so far. It's not a full bill. Uh, the framework calls for uh, spending $580 billion in new money over the next five years 
Uh, most of it is for transportation. There's a little tiny bit in there for water infrastructure and some for um, uh, broadband everywhere. Uh, the, uh, the problem has, the Senate whittled this uh, way down in size. Biden's plan used to be something like two trillion and now we're just down to 580 billion over five years. Uh, the, the, one of the reasons for whittling it down is the Senate was never able over the last five years to decide how they were going to pay for infrastructure. Uh, so in this plan, they uh, propose several ways to pay for it. One is through uh, implementation of something called an infrastructure financing authority. Uh, this is an unusual way to pay for anything through the federal budget. Normally, the ways that you pay for things, uh, if you propose something and you haven't got enough ongoing tax money coming in to pay for it, then you have one of three options. You can either cut spending someplace else, or you can raise more taxes, or you can deficit spend. Those are the only three options for financing something through the budget. So having this financing authority is very unusual. Tax uh, experts who, who've weighed in on this call it fairy dust or wishful thinking or whatever. Uh, be that as it may, we'll, we'll leave that aside for a minute. Uh, and then the second proposal in there was better IRS uh, tax enforcement. Uh, so the idea was that they were going to budget $40 billion to throw at the IRS so that they could beef up their uh, enforcement. And hopefully they would be able to, to then collect $100 billion in revenues. Well, when uh, that idea got a little bit fleshed out or clearer, then the Republicans objected to it because they don't really want to pay any new taxes to pay for infrastructure. Uh, and then at the same time, progressives were coming along and they wanted to spend more on passenger rail and, and high-speed rail. Uh, and uh, they've re recently woken up to the fact that rail is better for the, uh, the climate uh, and for, for, the, uh, for the world because it just uses less energy. And so uh, it's, it gives us less CO2. But in order to have a full-fledged high-speed rail system, uh, you really need a whole lot of more money for, than that. And that would raise this, which would mean that they would be back to the problem of how to finance. So this is a conundrum here. Uh, the most recent uh, occurrence was that Schumer forced this plan to the Senate to, uh, on a procedural vote to, set, to ask, could they bring it to the floor to debate it? And uh, a lot of the senators, including some of those who were in the bipartisan group, objected. Uh, they said, no, 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 we're not going to agree to something, a pig and a poke, when we haven't, we don't know what's in it. So uh, they want to see actually the bill. Uh, and they were busy writing all, all weekend long trying to write it, going back and forth on how this pay for and all these other kind of things. Uh, uh, by the time it came to the Wednesday vote, the Senate uh, voted down on a procedural basis to bring it to the floor. So the idea now is Schumer is still working on the bill and uh, will bring it forward again uh, for a vote in the Senate. So maybe the bipartisan plan will pass, we're not sure, but then there's still this problem with this in infrastructure financing authority, which I'm gonna come back to. Uh, the second thing that's going on is that the, you, that the government needs to pass a budget for next fiscal year. And contained in the budget are things like reauthor the standard reauthorizations for transportation. That's embodied in a bill that was uh, passed by the House, a deposito bill passed by the House for transportation. And then also for water infrastructure, both the Senate and the House have passed uh, uh, bills on water infrastructure. They're still quite small around the 30 to $50 billion range, uh, but they need to all be paid for. Uh, add to that, uh, um, Representative Clyburn uh, has asked for, has a bill in for much more uh, broadband money than is contained in bipartisan plan. And, he need, and he's asking for, for money for that. And in addition to that, uh, Seth Moulton from Massachusetts has a high-speed rail bill in for $250 billion, still not enough, uh, but he's asking for money for that. So these are, these are on the sidelines also asking for money. Uh, what you should need to know is that the federal budget is in chronic deficit right now. Uh, we're spending um, more on uh, tax credits for children, which is a good thing. Uh, those, those started going out in July, and that will have really help with uh, poverty and uh, child, you know, child care uh, in, in, across the country. But that creates more deficit spending. And then, of course, we need to appropriate somehow for all the normal discretionary spending that should occur in fiscal year 2022. 
and then on add to that that there is a, a debt limit extension, uh, an extension on the debt limit, which which uh, means that you don't need to have abide by any uh, debt ceiling, but that limit en ends on August 31st. And so if all these bills are not in anything that's going to have re re result in deficit spending, uh, then it'll be hitting up against this debt limit and the GOP uh, might try to block uh, that way. And then add to that finally, uh, that we still have sitting on the sideline, the American Families Plan, which before was 8.1 trillion and now has taken on some parts of the Biden infrastructure plan that didn't make it into the bipartisan plan. So that's more money. So altogether, the budget is in huge disarray. It's going to be really interesting to see how they do a bipartisan bill with 60 votes in the Senate and how they also do a, any kind of funding for the government under reconciliation process, which could result in deficit spending. But our, uh, if it goes up, then our deficit will go up and our debt will go up. So that's the status of where we are on funding infrastructure through the budget. Now, um, there have been calls for uh, infrastructure, infrastructure banks to finance or top up what the budget can't cover. Currently in the 117th Congress, there are uh, one, two, three, four, five bills uh, for infrastructure banks or corporations or investment authorities uh, that have just popped up. Uh, the first one, of course, is our bill, uh, HR 3339. Uh, which calls for a, um, a, a bank to a public bank to lend up to five trillion dollars over the next 10 years for infrastructure. And we have a full costing of this money. OK, it didn't come from nowhere, but it, we have really good, uh, um, you know, um, uh, resources for for and uh, for confirming that, that we need at least this much money to fix our infrastructure problems. Then we have four other bills. This one uh, is a bill called the Infrastructure Financing Authority, the same name that was used in the bipartisan plan. Uh, it uh, is a, a put out by Mark Warner and uh, Senator Mark Warner from Virginia and has also a House uh, bill version of it uh, as well. Uh, this bill uh, asks for um, $10 billion appropriation from the budget, so that would have to be added. And then it uh, promises in the bill itself to be able to lend up to 210 billion over 10 years. So you can see that that's way not enough compared to our need. Our need is 5 trillion. So uh, it's too small. And then in addition to that, it requires public private partnerships. Uh, Dr. Stephen Hubbard is gonna tell you why uh, that those are blazingly bad, uh, that's a blazingly bad idea, but suffice it to say that um, the, you do not get low cost financing when you go with public private partnerships because they have to have a higher internal rate of return. And our bank, for example, lends really low rates at treasury bond rates, um, will keep the financing costs down. This one will not keep the, and this will not keep the kind of financing costs down. And these, these uh, be benefits or net internal rates of return will go to private companies. They will not stay in uh, public hands and public good. Uh, there was a second, uh, another bill that was just reintroduced uh, by uh, Rep, uh, Rosa DeLauro from Connecticut. It's been introduced for the last 18 years or so, hasn't quite made it. Uh, it, it asked for an appropriation of 25 billion over five years, uh, which could make, make it possible for that fund to finance up to $250 billion out of the fund and then requires that public-private partnerships or P3s come up with another $250 billion, have a matching fund. So potentially this, this bank could lend out $500 billion. Still way too small compared to the need and requires public-private partnerships and requires a budget appropriation. Another bill that just came out uh, re really recently uh, from Rep uh, Sean Patrick Maloney from New York is essentially, as I read the bill, uh, it's really the DeLauro bill without P3s. So it asks for a budget appropriation of 50 billion. It'll, it'll lend out maybe 500 billion on a ratio of one to 10. Doesn't require public-private partnerships, but that's the biggest uh, appropriation that we need to come up from the budget to get this bank started and it's still way too small. And then finally, uh, Rip Carbajal from California reintroduced his National Infrastructure Investment Corporation. Uh, that would, instead of asking for money from the federal budget, would go to pension funds 
and ask to borrow money from them up to uh, five billion uh, uh, per year for five years, which means it could lend out 25 billion. Uh, and then it must pay to the pension funds a, a rather large uh, interest rate, um, which will make this bank and these loans possibly not competitive with say municipal bonds, much higher than the uh, rate of lending that the National Infrastructure Bank will charge. So um, it's not feasible, I'm not, not clear that this is feasible of a feasible proposal, uh, although it doesn't require public-private partnerships. So altogether, we really need to keep interest rate costs down on these proposals. It, the bank needs to be big enough to cover everything. And we want to avoid public-private partnerships, keep uh, infrastructure, public infrastructure and public hands. So that's it for me. So All thanks right. very much. Thanks, Alfeca. <clears throat> With that, uh, we're going to uh, move and jump around here a little bit. Uh, we're going to ask um, <coughs> uh, sh <coughs> Shannon uh, Bill Bray Axelrod if she would uh, be happy to share with us uh, some of the news that she's been working on in, in Nevada. Well, thank you. Um, I'm Assemblywoman Shannon Bill Bray Axelrod. Um, and I was the primary sponsor on the assembly joint resolution to um, bring the, um, the resolution to our delegation, um, really pushing forward the first bill that uh, Alfeca spoke of. Um, I had the, the pleasure of working with Alfeca during the legislative session. And I really do mean that it really was a, a, a pleasure. She is a, a national treasure. So um, when it comes to this issue, so, I would just say um, I was I was very excited um, about this resolution when it, it came to me, and I, I thought it made perfect sense. I didn't really know what I was if I was going to get pushback and who I was going to get pushback from. But I have to tell you, um, we had a very very strong bipartisan um, co-sponsoring. We, we went around and and explained to people what it was and what it did. And um, that helped, we, it was very well received in our inf growth and infrastructure committee and then um, passed unanimously through the Senate. We have, um, we have six members of what we, they call their, the Freedom Caucus. Um, so you can imagine um, those folks, the very, very Trumpian kind of vote red on everything. So even though their constituency, we actually had a lot of people coming forward saying that this was a great thing um, for even conservative Republicans because it doesn't add to the overall deficit. Um, you know, they just like to press that red button more than they I press the green button. So um, I would just say that I would encourage you to reach out um, to your legislators or a delegation if you want me to talk to anyone, I'm happy to do that just to explain to them um, the way I was, I sort of lobbied the bill or lobbied the resolution um, and really got a ton of um, bipartisan support. So with that, I, I open it to any questions or um, whatever you would like. All right, well, thank you so much for that. And, and <clears throat> you have done tremendous work there in, in Nevada to be able to make that happen. Uh, uh, you, <clears throat> you're one of only two states that have gotten it passed through both houses and that, that's really impressive. I know we've been working on it here in Ohio to try and, and do it, but uh, uh, it, it's, it's hard work and it, it's great to have somebody like you to be able to champion that and, and we continue to look for that. Uh, that's the one thing I would say on this phone call. If you have any personal contacts with anyone in the legislature, uh, please reach out to them. Uh, get them the information that they need uh, so that they can start to understand that this is the, the real answer to the financing of the national uh, infrastructure needs of our country. And we need to have that uh, done. With, <clears throat> and thank you for that. Uh, with that, we're going to get back a little bit on the program here. And I'm going to ask Dr. Stephen Hubbard uh, to uh, talk, if he wouldn't mind, on the uh, PPPs that uh, Alfeca referred to and, and give us a little bit of an update sure. on that. So, Dr. Stephen? I'm sorry, I can't share my screen. Okay. Now you got it. There you go. Okay. All right. Now, now you have to share your screen because we see yes, you. Yes, yes. And uh, it takes me always a second to uh, get everything no up. There you go. 
Okay, so my name is Dr. Stephen Hubbard. I did my doctoral thesis on uh, infrastructure banks and why the Federal Highway Department Infrastructure Bank uh, failed. And it was basically uh, not enough money and uh, not enough money to manage it is the, uh, the short uh, list on that. So I'm going to talk a little bit. Of, oops, I'm uh, uh, at the, uh, the payoff slide here. So I'm going to talk a little bit about public-private partnerships and uh, why they work in some circumstances, but they're not a panacea and they're certainly not a lifeboat that uh, can be depended on. So the basic model is, is that I have something that I need to do, but I don't have the political or an economic capital or the expertise to do it. And I also, as I look at it, maybe my costs are going to be really high. And so then what I do is I look at whatever it is that's going to be built or provided. So it could be a service um, or because I have asset here, but uh, but it could be a service also like trash pickup or um, uh, a network or a ballpark or whatever, plus the benefit minus the profit that the um, uh, private partnership is going to take away is either going to be positive for me or negative. And so let's just imagine that these can all be expressed accurately in dollars. And so that's basically what you're doing. So the key for this is that it's, uh, it only works if it's easy for the government to exit. So if you take, a, say, a sewer system and you uh, privatize it and you're basically locked into that company for 30 years, they can do anything they want um, with uh, the rates or hide things in the background, and you're basically on the hook. In other words, you, there's no marketplace involved here because uh, a lot of times you hear, oh, let's turn loose the marketplace on this problem. Let's know, let's give a monopoly to this one company and we're going to cross our fingers to see whether uh, it works or not. And something else that's not really well known, but it's very important is that there's no long-term knowledge. So if I have a concession at a, um, a sports arena or something like that, and people are flipping burgers and making food and it's not being well done, I can change that company out for something else. They're coming in and using the facility Facilities. And if the people who flip burgers or make the whatever the food is from one uh, company and they're exchanged with ones from another, I haven't lost any knowledge. But if I build a water system that's privatized and the uh, company uh, basically uses low cost labor and has a large flow through of employees because they're not paying them benefits and things like this, then if I try and take it over later because it's failing, suddenly I discover that the knowledge that I need is gone. It's not there in the institution. And just as an example, someone uh, makes something and buries it. Um, if I have a photograph, the cost is nothing, but if they didn't document it properly, it could cost me millions of dollars to get that basic knowledge. So there's an enormous hidden cost potentially. So, uh, and as Alfeca said, that basically PPPs need 10 to 15% because you can go uh, overseas and easily find 10 to 15% profit from various ventures. And why should capital come to your particular berg if they can get 15% offshore? Um, and the uh, issue here is most infrastructure barely breaks even. Um, I've got a little bit later on, but uh, here, yes, 61% of roads in the United States break even or lose money. And I'll get back to that in a second. Um, but basically, um, there are government programs such as TIFIA uh, for transportation that have essentially the same mechanism that are offered by the uh, proposed banks and PPPs. And they have $1.6 billion worth of funds sitting there. And they basically made no rural grants. And the reason is, is because they just don't work for, for small utilities that don't have that enormous overhead. And so back to this, uh, this is from a Brookings Institute uh, paper, 60%, 1% of the roads in the United States break even or lose money. And so what happens is the profitable roads um, subsidize the unprofitable ones. So if you then privatize those profitable roads, guess what? Now, you know, someone like me who has a stock portfolio, I'm enjoying that money and someone who basically um, can barely aff you know, afford a car and now has their taxes go up to pay for the fact that the money is flowing into my pocket. So that's just completely unfair. And, and as a result, basically they only work for one or 2% of uh, infrastructure. So examples, um, so does that mean that they fail? No, there are lots and lots of examples and, and there are quite a few, but the Transcontinental Railway, Railway and the Erie Canal, which was finished under budget and ahead of schedule and was a roaring success are two uh, examples that are used over and over again in the United States. As I mentioned, concessions, trash removal, some of the cities around Phoenix, for example, um, both use vector control and trash removal from contractors. And if one isn't doing a good job, they can change them out and there's not a big loss because they're all using standards equipment and the knowledge is easily learned. Um, 
But what happens when you privatize water systems? Food and Water Watch has looked at this. On average, the costs go up 33% for water systems, sewer percent 60% or more. And in 2014, you can go find it on YouTube, and it's in my slides here. There was basically a, a, a joint committee on private private partnerships, and they had a contractor who has 125 years of experience, and he said, "Oh yeah, only 800 to, out of the 52,000 U.S. water systems were privatized, and these are ones that can raise their rates without." passing special legislation, 1.5%. Other uh, uh, famous fiascos, the Indiana I-69 would had Vice President Pence basically uh, uh, ballyhooing how much money this was going to save. Um, they fell behind. There was fighting between the contractors. Cost ballooned by 50%, and the government had to take over, and it was two years behind schedule. Another famous fl flame out was uh, SR-125 down near San Diego, south of me. That basically, there was a 50% uh, shortfall in revenue. They had misjudged the market. Um, they went bankrupt. There were millions, $750 million worth of lawsuits, and uh, it took $40 million to basically bail it out. And they had to cancel I-805. And if you know anything about San Diego and expansion, there's terrible traffic and can take you an hour and a half to get through some of the interchanges. So, uh, but that's the, just like the small fry. What happens when you wind up for the big warm up for the big leagues? London Underground, 1998 renewal, PPP, three different ventures, all uh, went belly up. The cost to London was 175 to 500 million. I actually talked to one of the managers who was doing cleanup, and he said the austerity that they practiced while trying to make maximize their money while you know glorifying the small changes that they were making. He said it takes them seven took was taking them seven years to recover for every year of austerity that went on during this fiasco. Three Mile Island was also a PPP. Um, I won't go into the details there, but basically. They were um, trying to save money on a tax break, and so they had the reactor up and running. When it had, was it illegally uh, illegally running? It shouldn't have been to tr try and uh, save a few million dollars on tax breaks, and it cost one to two billion dollars. Privatization of the Texas grid, starting in 1970, when it was done, supposedly because they disconnected it sort of from the rest of the nation, supposedly because Texas was going to do it right. The prices prices over that time from 1970 to 2011 went up 60% faster than the rest of the country. Um, they've paid since 2004, $28 billion more for their power. In 2011, uh, there was a cold snap and, and uh, the government warned them, the FERC, that their system was at risk for a major disaster. What did they do with the 10 years of um, uh, warning before the 2021 cold snap this uh, February? Absolutely nothing. 4.5 million homes without, went out without power for weeks on end, and it was responsible for somewhere between two to four, 200 to 700 deaths, and uh, the total cost is $28 billion. California power crisis, 2001 to 2002, we're going to deregulate the power grid and let the power of the marketplace uh, take over. The power was going to go down by a factor of three, and instead, um, because the system could be gamed, the power went up by a factor of three. I was working at the Metropolitan Water District at the time, which performed uh, uh, supplies uh, th um, two thirds of the water to uh, 8 million people here in, or excuse me, 18 million people in here in Southern California by volume. It's the world's largest water company. Our costs went up $132 million for the same amount of power in one year. And it took out one third of our $500 million rate stabilization fund, which we'd spent 15 years building up. Then the cost of the country was 45 billion. It threw California into a recession and then threw the US into a recession. If you remember when Bush take o took over, he said, oh, the, there's, the economy isn't nearly as good as we thought. What caused it? The California power deregulation. And finally, the, uh, the mother of all uh, fiascos, the Deepwater Horizon, which is privatization of uh, US uh, oil reserves. BP, as a warm up, was in charge of the uh, barge that was supposed to contain the spill at the Exxon for the Exxon Valdez. Of course, it was parked and wasn't available for two to three months if they tried to get into the water. So that was a huge fiasco. The cost of the Macondo well it was $3 billion, but it was late. And the senior executives decided to save $100,000 um, and uh, cancel the Schlumberger team who was going to do what's known as a well log, where they look at the concrete with ultrasound to make sure that the well is sealed. The thing blew up, uh, spilled uh, billions of gallons of oil, and the cost is now uh, $61 billion and climbing. So, and, and so in summary here, there are five banks out there that are all people. 
pace, um, and they're somewhere around 10 to $50 billion to start. Um, however, this yellow area here, this is the size of the um, deferred maintenance, excuse me, the backlog that we need to spend each year to uh, uh, basically um, cover the, um, excuse me, to uh, fix our infrastructure. And these little squares represent, this is a $10 billion um, a year PPP bank. And this is basically one to 2%, um, uh, uh, which is what uh, PPPs can cover. And the yellow square represents the total need. So as you can see, these things are just absolutely not going to come close to filling the need. Is, uh, the actual backlog is four to $7 trillion and um, the banks are just uh, completely inadequate. And uh, I think I'll stop there and uh, let other people go. Well, uh, thank you for that. Uh, there's a lot of information there to take in and uh, I'm sure there'll be an opportunity to uh, come back for a couple of questions. Uh, with that, uh, I'm gonna ask Representative Joe Cerisi uh, if he wouldn't mind uh, starting up and sharing with us uh, what he's working on. Joe. Well, thank you. It's always great to be on this call. Um, we've been on multiple calls with you now. Alfeca always gives a great overview of what we're doing. And uh, I look, look forward to the day to meet each and every one of you in person. Uh, I'm Representative Joe Cerisi. I'm sitting outside because we haven't had a beautiful day here in Pennsylvania in a little while. I don't know if a lot of you know, but through the global warming and what was happening with the fires out west, we were under smoke advisories for two days in the East Coast, and it was pretty bad. So tonight is a beautiful night here in Pennsylvania. Um, but Pennsylvania is among some of the worst uh, infrastructure issues in the nation. We have uh, my colleagues who are on, Representative Jim Roebuck, who just retired from the House, could talk to you about over the years, the issues we've had, and Representative Derisha Parker, who's on with me, can talk to you about some of our issues. But our roads, bridges, our waterways, we have issues in Pennsylvania. And being the founding state for this bank, um, we welcome the opportunity to open the bank once again in the great state of Pennsylvania, in the great city of Philadelphia, where our nation began. And as we're looking to approach the 250th anniversary of this nation and know that Philadelphia still has things from 250 years ago that need of improvements, um, we welcome the idea of a $5 trillion bank, uh, which we're gonna be funding programs. Now, where I live, I'm in the western part of Montgomery County, which is the biggest county of the Collier counties outside of Philadelphia, the third largest county in the state outside of Pittsburgh and Philadelphia. And we once upon a time, everybody who's ever played Monopoly knows about the Reading Railroad. The Reading Railroad once ran from Reading to Philadelphia to New York. In the 80s, they got rid of it. Well, where I live was never supposed to be developed because you can't see it in the picture that I have on here, but just six miles to my west is Limerick, nuclear power plant. Um, it is one of the, the newest nuclear power plants in the arsenal of, arsenal is the wrong word, but on the, in this, the amount of energy plants we have in this nation, uh, it's a great plant, um, but this area, people never thought that people would come out here and live because we had a power plant. Well, we are growing in leaps and bounds and our highways can't sustain the growth any longer. And we need to put public transit back in place. This bank will give us an opportunity to put public transit back to almost 700,000 people from Reading to Philadelphia, and then going beyond that. Um, so we are working hard with our colleagues in the House to try and get more and more people on. We have spoken to our colleagues on the other side of the aisle um, who are starting to jump in on this, and we're speaking to our representatives in Congress and, of course, our U.S. senators. All of you, no matter where you live, um, like Stuart has said and everyone has said before and Alfeca has said, please reach out to your local elected officials, your townships, your boroughs, your municipalities, the cities, get them all on board for this. This brings people back to work. It brings our economies back and coming out of COVID, we need this. I know there's a lot of union leadership on this call. We need those great paying union jobs to be able to expand. And we need to have the opportunity for our children to have these great paying jobs. I'm a product of the unions. My father was a union member his whole career of UAW in New York. Um, and I know what it's like. I'm working with my colleague in Ohio to talk about making sure that our schools have what they need so these students are trained right out of high school and go into the profession and are able to work with this because we need a workforce development. We're gonna have thousands of jobs we're adding, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. We need to make sure we have the resources for that. So I'll take questions. I'll go off uh, mic now and camera, but thank you all for being on this. Please pass the word to your local communities 
And um, if I don't know if any of my colleagues who are on want to say anything, I don't know what the order is, but I know that uh, Representative Parker did comment in the chat. Um, she's a great colleague of mine and a hard worker in the greater Philadelphia area. And we miss uh, Representative Roebuck, who retired this year. So thank you. Thanks, Joe. Uh, we're going <clears> to <throat> wind up uh, doing a lot of that uh, when we get to the Q&A and, and uh, give it, uh, everyone an opportunity to be able to uh, uh, ask questions or make comments as we go forward. So, but uh, we need to kind of move forward a little bit. So I'm going to ask uh, the majority leader, uh, Mary Jane Shimsky to please uh, uh, come on and be able to uh, share with us what's going on in New York. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, generally, uh, when we go on these calls, um, I generally talk about the need in New York. And New York um, is in many ways a typical state, uh, like the states in the Northeast and the Midwest, we have relatively old infrastructure. We also have a very diverse state. We have some of the most concentrated urban areas in the country. We also have some of the most rural areas in the country. Uh, so in some senses, we're in every person when it comes to infrastructure. And it's, it's hard, it's just about incalculable what the need is in our state. Um, 1,702 bridges, which is just shy of 10% of all of the bridges in New York State, are structurally deficient. A, a somewhat larger percentage are considered functionally obsolete, which means they're doing work that they were not designed to do. Over 7,000 miles of highway are in poor condition. Many more miles are not in poor condition, but not in good condition either. Um, we need over $36.2 billion over the next two decades to update our wastewater infrastructure. Um, our drinking water infrastructure has a um, estimated gap of $22.8 billion. I don't think any of these figures really come to grips with the sewer crisis, which is beginning to show its head in urban areas throughout our state. Uh, the schools have a gap of almost $3.3 billion in terms of funding. 11% of our trains and other mass transit rolling stock are beyond their useful life. Um, and that does not include what we need for the future, whether it's high speed rail, whether it's electric vehicle charging stations, clean energy, energy efficiency retrofits to cut down our need on fossil fuels, um, our storm resiliency. We're, Westchester is a great big funnel, springs water from the Catskills to the Atlantic Ocean. We are really starting to get hammered by climate change. We need resiliency to make sure our buildings and our other installations are redesigned and reconstructed to deal with um, the increasing severity of storms we're seeing. Uh, we need stormwater management and flood control. Broadband is a huge issue. Close to two out of five low-income New Yorkers have no access to broadband. If you want to participate in today's economy, if you want your children to do well in school, you need broadband. This is a very important uh, link to upward mobility in our society today. And we are way behind as are many other areas. Um, every state just about has a similar story. The numbers may be kind of different. The mix of issues may be a little bit different, but the need throughout the country for a national infrastructure bank to supplement the um, appropriations process is vast. Um, Westchester County early in the spring um, passed a resolution in support of the National Infrastructure Bank. I have just introduced to the New York State Association of Counties a resolution in support of the National Infrastructure Bank. We will consider that resolution at our September semi-annual meeting of NYSEC. Um, in addition to reaching out to your to your colleagues in the uh, legislative or executive bodies that you're in. In addition 
to reaching out to your colleagues and other levels of government. These professional associations, if you will, um, associations of counties, uh, municipalities, and so on, um, are also very important platforms to bring the message of the National Infrastructure Bank to and to leverage the power that those organizations have lobbying in Washington. So um, our people in Congress will hear more and more from more and more diverse associations about how badly all of our jurisdictions need the help that we would get from a national infrastructure bank. So thank you very much, everyone. I'm going to have to jump off to go to the next meeting, but um, I know that everyone who's here on the phone will be able to answer a lot of questions about how the bank would work and what plans we're making going forward. I just urge all of you to find a way to become involved with the movement and bring in as many people and organizations as you can. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, you bring up some excellent points there that it, it's about being able to build that parade. I've always said we have to build the parade so that the politicians can run to the front and take credit for it. And uh, it's gonna take uh, a lot of that uh, uh, groundwork and, and, and grassroots work to make it happen and, and working through whatever organization you have or whatever uh, connections you have is important. I always say we all have something to do. It may, it may, not, be, uh, it may not be huge, but it's very important and you need to do your small part because we need everybody involved in this. So thank you very much. Absolutely. Uh, we're you. going to now move on to uh, uh, <clears throat> former Representative Lamar Lemons uh, from Michigan. And uh, uh, if he wouldn't mind uh, unmuting and putting himself on, it'd be fantastic. <sighs> Here we are. There you okay. are. Okay. Uh, the, um, we have uh, introduced to uh, State Senator Betty Jean Alexander, if you see the resolution on your screen, uh, she is uh, the first uh, signer, to make, making her the sponsor of the, uh, of the bill. It is uh, Senate Re Resolution 77. Uh, and so we are moving to see if we can uh, have this adopted in both chambers. Um, our first step is to get uh, secure two more Republican uh, co-sponsors. Uh, currently, we have two Republican co-sponsors. So we want to also work, um, uh, work those, uh, congress those uh, Senate districts. Uh, our Senate districts are roughly half the size of a congressional district. We have uh, 38 senators. Uh, in the uh, uh, in the state of Michigan, uh, state uh, state senators and the um, re Democrats are in the minority as they are in, in actually most states, and they are the Democrats have sixteen, and the um, uh, the, the Republicans have uh, twenty two. Um, so the we always uh, to have a majority, you would need uh, uh, nineteen. We do have the governor, so we need uh, nineteen votes plus the uh, Lieutenant Governor to constitute a majority in our state. The, um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, we have two, so if we could get two more um, Republican um, uh, 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 co-sponsors, it, it becomes, uh, it, it will expedite uh, the moving of this uh, legislation. We, but uh, we did it in such a way um, that um, that would uh, re require a hearing so that we could uh, have uh, Alfeca and other ex people with expertise come in and uh, make a presentation. So there's a, a greater understanding rather than just, uh, okay, we're sending something to Congress and we know uh, what, what they're going to. So we did it deliberately in, the, in, in this fashion. So I would like um, um, as many members of the um, NIB uh, coalition to call Republican state uh, senators in the state of Michigan, get to know them, call their offices. As you know, uh, it, things are really moved through the staff. If you convince the staff, they can convince um, 
uh, um, their senator that is a good thing and it's in the interest of their uh, constituents. Um, also, if you um, have any contacts with any of those uh, constituent groups in the which in the Republican Party, the local chambers are the are, are really button pushers. So if you can get the um, um, the the local chambers in those respective Senate uh, districts to uh, buy into um, the NIB and buy into uh, ho uh, House Resolution um, mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, 3339, then we, 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 we it will uh, more likely move more expeditiously. Currently, we are um, we are on uh, break, so it, uh, it won't uh, come to fruition until sometime in the fall. Well, thank you very much for that, uh, Lamar. It's good seeing you, my friend. It's been a while. Mm -hmm. uh, glad to uh, see your face there. Uh, <laughs> Hopefully things are well in, in Michigan. Uh, and we had floods, infrastructure. Yeah. <laughs> you need a little bit of infrastructure there, don't you? Exactly. <laughs> I think that seems to be the, uh, the roll call throughout the United States. When we start to look around, there, there's, there's all kinds of... Uh, of things happening and, and uh, uh, <clears throat> tragic events. Uh, I mean, the the I forty bridge there between across the Mississippi's got more than a few cracks in it. Uh, it's just there's accidents out there waiting to happen. And and I know everyone on this call is working hard to try to figure out how we can convince those uh, that have the the power to be able to actually move forward and invest in this country. And that's something we really need to do. Next, I'm gonna ask Mary Elford uh, from Florida, if she wouldn't mind sharing with us uh, some of her efforts down there in Gainesville, Florida. So Mary. Uh, hi, um, I am uh, Mary Elford. I'm a, actually a professional engineer and a newly elected county commissioner. I have uh, when I was running, I ran on roads, and when I got into office, I found it wasn't as simple as, um, you know, reallocation of finances or uh, redoing our priorities, but that we were $600 million behind on uh, our road maintenance, and we were budgeting something like $6 million a year. So when I started doing research, I found the uh, NIB coalition, and um and started supporting a national infrastructure bank. So uh, not only have I gotten our uh, local county to sign a resolution of support, and, um, but I've met with uh, some of the um, small cities around our region. And uh, we have here in Florida, something called regional planning councils. And I sit on the regional planning council and I brought uh, this to the um, director's attention. And he was extremely enthusiastic. And uh, we actually had Al Fekin and uh, uh, some other folks come on, come and speak to our regional planning council. That is a, um, a group of, uh, I think 14 counties um, in North Central Florida or actually just North Florida. And uh, we passed unanimously a resolution of support from the Regional Planning Council, which I believe will be a uh, great help in getting the attention of our legislators. Legislators. So um, then I uh, more recently um, have worked uh, with the National Association of Counties. The National Association of Counties is a... Uh, obviously a nationwide organization with representatives from every state, I believe, oh, except one, uh, I think Vermont or somebody is that doesn't wanna play, but um, thousands and thousands of members and they had their national conference uh, just last week, uh, got home from that um, in DC this year. It was a combination of a legislative conference and their uh, educational conference. Every year on their educational conference, they accept resolutions of support that they will lobby uh, the, the administration uh, for. And um, they get a seat at the table in the White House sometimes, you know, so it's, it's good to have their support. 
And I'm happy to say that it was introduced by the Transportation Committee where it passed unanimously and then was accepted without debate uh, by the whole National Association of Counties, which I, I see as a pretty good accomplishment. Um, my only uh, concern was is that uh, we need to get the uh, the uh, bill number on the resolution of support so they don't confuse it with any of these other resolutions that are, uh, or any of these other uh, infrastructure bank proposals that are out there. Um, so that's, that's what I've been doing here in Florida. It's certainly something that we definitely need. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much for that, uh, uh, Mary. And, and, and getting the counties, the, the thing that uh, is important about counties and, and what a lot of people fail to understand is that counties are largely Republican in, in nature as far as the representation once you start to go around. And uh, it just shows you that uh, infrastructure, it, it doesn't know party. At the well, end of the day, they, they all need infrastructure and they all need the investment and they're just trying to figure out how to be able to get the money. And, and that's the one thing that I will say at the end of the day, our bank talks about. It talks yeah. about investing in every community, and that's the biggest challenge that uh, we currently have. Well, I, I, if I can interject slightly, um, one of the things that I was most impressed about with the National Association of Counties is the lack of emphasis on political party. Uh, no one ever asks if you're a Democrat or a Republican. Nobody talks about any of the proposals being um, you know, liberal or conservative, everything is, uh, you know, most county officials are just about getting the work done. And that is, uh, you know, why it wasn't debated. Everybody saw the need and uh, agreed that this is the right answer. Uh, without a doubt. And that, that's, that's what, that outside the beltway, once you get into uh, real America, to be able to do it, it, it's amazing how many people understand uh, uh, the shortcomings that we have and, and how much they actually, uh, once they start to realize that uh, uh, this National Infrastructure Bank offers the real opportunity to be able to invest everywhere uh, and to be able to address the real needs in this country, uh, people, people start to say, this is easy. How come, how come they can't get it? Well, we all know, unfortunately, once you get up to Washington, things kind of change a little bit. So again, the thing we have to continue to do is, is like what you're doing and everybody else that's uh, been on this phone call that's working uh, towards it. It's about doing those little pieces to be able to build it so that the momentum kind of snowballs until uh, they don't have a choice but to actually adopt it. So uh, thank you again for, for all that you do. Uh, next, we're going to ask uh, Dennis Montoya uh, if he wouldn't mind uh, sharing uh, some of his uh, uh, things, that, some of what he's working on in New Mexico. So. Uh, Dennis. Oh, looks like Dennis is not with us. So we're going to move on. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Lou Spencer, who's vice president of the Virginia State Building and Construction Trades uh, Council, uh, to, to share what's going on in Virginia. Well, um, really not a whole lot to report on things in Virginia, but I did want to um, say hello to everyone and remind everyone that in order to resolve the economic and policymaking dilemma on infrastructure, with Congress and the White House entangled in the debate on how to pay for the American Jobs Plan, our coalition is urging Congress to act and create the National Infrastructure Bank the new bank will support upwards to four to five trillion directly into infrastructure project. It's an excellent program and will cost the federal budget uh, almost nothing while creating millions of high paying jobs. We know that infrastructure development needs careful planning and re a reliable source of long term funding in order for it to succeed. It is most unlikely that adequate infrastructure financing to cover the, all the nation's infrastructure needs will ever come from the federal budget. So legislation like HR 3339 has been introduced into Congress to create a four to $5 trillion national infrastructure bank. And the national infrastructure bank is configured to attract maximum political support from both Republicans and Democrats in Congress. 
infrastructure projects will be vetted according to their cost and a cost benefit analysis instead of specific criteria set out in the bill. Our nation requires improved highways, roads, bridges, mass transit, water and sewer lines, airports, seaports, rail, electric power, and telecommunication systems. Addressing the nation's infrastructure needs and more, the National Infrastructure Bank will uplift millions from humble circumstances into respectable careers, build up our urban and rural areas, support commerce and manufacturing, and restore a sense of dignity and confidence to our great nation. For all we know, we are at a precise moment in history. This opportunity may not come our way for generations, and we must rise to the occasion. Future generations, future generations will thank us. Um, thanks, and have a great evening. Thanks for listening. All right. Thank you, uh, Joy, uh, Joe, for that. Uh, uh, jo Man, I'm sorry. Thank you, Lou, for that. Yeah, no problem. It's late, okay. Bob. It's okay. <laughs> I'm over here looking at too many different things instead of paying attention to what I'm supposed to be talking about. It's I okay. Probably... Sorry, brother. I know. All right. Well, thanks, Lou, for that. Uh, next, we have Julie Olson. Uh, she's uh, based in Alaska, but she's also been working in Washington, and, and uh, I know that she's been doing some marvelous work. So, Julie? Hello, everyone. Can, can you hear me? We can. All right. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here tonight. Um, I'm only going to take uh, a minute or so because I want to get to the questions and answers. But um, I want to thank Dr. Hubbard for um, pointing out some of the challenges in terms of building infrastructure with public-private partnerships. But I want to stress to everyone that um, this bill is not anti-business. In fact, every business in America will benefit from these investments in infrastructure. So the engineers, the contractors, the designers, the architects, the uh, building material suppliers, the um, businesses that use railroads and roads to, transportate, to transport their freight, the ports, all of those private businesses are going to benefit from this development. Uh, one of the examples I use is in the Pacific Northwest in Seattle, which has horrendous traffic. Um, the, they uh, put in a light rail that goes um, both north and south from the airport to downtown Seattle to the University of Washington and such. And if you were to take that light rail uh, system, you would see at every single stop along the way, there are new apartment buildings, commercial buildings, revitalization of restaurants and commercial buildings. So those kinds of developments are going to happen all across America if we're able to put in high speed rail, improve our roads, improve our ports, and of course, by extending broadband to rural America, we're gonna be able to um, um, incentivize private development in rural America as people who live in those communities are gonna be able to have remote working opportunities, um, telehealth and um, uh, distance learning opportunities. So I just like to stress for everyone that this can really be uh, considered uh, a pro-business bill and we should be using that when we uh, talk to our Republican representatives in Congress. And I think it's really important that we reach out to Republicans and independents and ask for their support on this, because after all, uh, there's no party associated with having good roads. So thanks everyone for being here and, and uh, for your support of this movement. Thanks for that, Julie. Uh, you're not smart. taking enough credit for all the things you've been working on, though. No. <laughs> I mean, uh, oh. I, I've seen a lot come across and, and you seem to be involved in a lot of it. So uh, I think uh, I thank you uh, for all that you're doing it is really appropriate here. So keep up the good work and hopefully everybody else is doing their small part. So thanks again. Uh, Jack Hanna from Oregon, if you wouldn't mind, uh, you're the last uh, uh, speaker that we have scheduled. And then we're going to open the floor up uh, for questions. So Jack. Thank you very much, Bob. Um, first, I wanna say this about the moment that we have arrived at as far as our country's focus of attention on our national infrastructure is concerned. It's not happened uh, for the last 60 or 70 years. We have a unique opportunity to address this matter. It can be done in a bipartisan fashion and it can be done the way that it's been done before four times successfully. And if we miss this opportunity, uh, it, it's going to have an adverse consequence as far as our country's future is concerned. Our economic system 
has tons of inefficiencies in it because of our failed, failing infrastructure. In our future, we need to compete uh, with uh, our foreign competitors in China and in the European community that have high-speed rail systems, uh, uh, better and better broadband reach, and better and better road and infra infrastructure um, uh, assets for uh, water and housing, et cetera. Uh, we cannot avoid to miss this moment, number one. Number two, our idea has not been um, explained to the public as much as we would like, but those that we have explained our idea and communicated with them, we have garnered tons of support. Uh, that includes most recently uh, 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 the National Association of Counties, the New Jersey Senate has passed a resolution approving it, the New Mexico League of United Latin American Citizens. Uh, in Pennsylvania, we have a huge amount of support, one of the most strongest uh, states that has gotten behind uh, our National Infrastructure Bank. We have over 50 state house members that are supporting the resolution, including Republicans and Democrats. Uh, the state Senate uh, has a resolution that's uh, again uh, 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 being proposed by two of the leading Democrats in leadership and also a Republican, a Republican senator. Uh, we've talked with congressional member staffs uh, and congresspersons uh, throughout the Commonwealth, over half of them, and it's increasing every day. Uh, we have Pittsburgh City Council, Philadelphia City Council, Allentown City Council supporting this. We have support. Once people understand how this bank runs, uh, uh, they agree with it. It's been done in the past. Uh, uh, Washington at this moment is failing. It's not having the scope uh, of, of addressing uh, the wider needs of our infrastructure. It's too narrow. And um, we fell in seizing the opportunity and addressing the problem by not going big. And finally, it's not deficit finance. And that is a problem that, that Washington fails to, to um, uh, appreciate the asset, the benefit, and the strength and the merit of what we are saying. Uh, we need to have everyone on this call and every state legislator and every Congress person understand what this bill is about, 39, 3339, and how it affects the, the, the future of our country. So please support this bill. Um, please lobby uh, everyone and anyone that you know that would have an interest in this. Uh, time is running out. Uh, if Washington fails, as it often does, it's going to be up to us to assert the argument uh, of uh, the merits of what we're trying to accomplish. Thank you so much. All right, thanks, Jack. Uh, it looks like Dennis Montoya was actually able to join us. Uh, he, he had some earlier problems. So Dennis, uh, the floor is yours. I am here, thank you. Uh, as your screen says, I am the immediate past state director of New Mexico LULAC, the League of United Latin American Citizens. Uh, and a permanent member, at least permanent as long as I pay dues of the executive board of New Mexico LULAC. And we have passed the resolution that appears on your screens. We have passed this resolution after uh, meeting repeatedly uh, with um, representatives of the NIB coalition and hearing about the details of what the NIB would mean. And we are um, not shy about uh, admitting that we are rather colloquial in our focus. We are focused on New Mexico that has some unique problems, unique and longstanding problems. One of the problems that Stuart and I uh, have discussed is the problem of the Asequia communities. Asequias are centuries old irrigation systems. Traditional Hispanic communities have used these for subsistence level um, farming irrigation for over 300 years. 
Well, climate change is affecting the RSA systems. We need water as badly as the rest of the state does. And we have other tremendous needs. We have a need for jobs. We have communities in New Mexico that uh, never emerged from the Great Depression. It's about time that some equal opportunity, equal economic opportunity was granted to us. And it is our strong feeling that the NIB represents that kind of opportunity. The NIB in general represents an opportunity for some long delayed economic equality, economic egalitarianism, the kind that has not been seen since the days of FDR and the New Deal. I know that my father worked for the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, and what is now being proposed is a, um, is a new kind of uh, core directed at climate change, directed at reversing the effects of climate change. Something that affects all of us and is hitting the desert Southwest particularly hard. So for all of these reasons and more reasons, uh, including the availability of high-speed internet throughout rural New Mexico, throughout Indian country, throughout the Navajo reservation, throughout Northern New Mexico in the far-flung uh, small villages where I grew up. Uh, all of these long-awaited infrastructure developments are within reach. And together, we can achieve uh, we can achieve this infrastructure development uh, and we can offer to our population a level of equality that we have never experienced in New Mexico. It's kind of an old joke among some New Mexicans, at least among some of my cohorts, that New Mexico is a state in name only because it would be embarrassing to have Puerto Rico in the middle of the mainland. <laughs> There's a lot of truth to that. If we look back at the history of the admission of New Mexico into a state, we were never admitted as a state, even though we were more than ready, until the Latino majority became a minority. And that happened in 1912. And although we had been trying for most of a century to gain admission to the union, Arizona got in um, about the same time that we did. And the only states that came after, of course, were Hawaii and Alaska. Well, Latinos are once again in the majority in New Mexico and have been for um, almost a decade. We are a minority majority state and our needs for infrastructure development and economic development generally are tremendous, more pronounced than the needs of our neighboring states. And our neighboring states definitely have needs as well. Um, we are the poorest state in the union, except for Mississippi. And there are many factors that go into that. We're obviously a very beautiful state. We're a tourist destination. We have advanced scientific laboratories, but we have tremendous disparity between the haves and the have nots. All of these inequities can be addressed by the NIB. We don't believe in pie in the sky. We don't think that the NIB is going to be a panacea for all the ills that have plagued us for a very long time, but we think it's an awfully good start. I want to congratulate everyone who has attended this Zoom and thank you for your continued support. Let's uh, close of a excellent uh, Zoom call here. I appreciate everybody 
uh, being on this call. Uh, as you see right now, you can see a number of our large uh, supporters that have been uh, involved in this. Uh, you'll recognize some of the uh, names on this. Uh, Central Label Council down there in New Mexico, Virginia, AFL-CIOs across uh, several states, uh, et cetera. Uh, again, whatever you can do to affect uh, the people who you are involved with and, and try to help them be able to uh, uh, get on board. Uh, please call your member of Congress and ask, ask them to co-sponsor HR 3 plus 3 plus 3 equals 9 so that we can make this happen. Again, it's 3339. It's important. And if you need more information or want to get more involved with us, please visit us at our website, uh, email us, or visit our Facebook page. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great evening, and we'll see you around. Good night, everyone. Good night.